Tennessee This Week from WATE 6 on your side starts now. It's good to be with you. I'm Don Hudson. Welcome to another edition of Tennessee This Week. We have our political pundits with us, as always, George Corda, a political analyst. Craig Griffith, our health care analyst, is here as well. Um, we want to get into a special session because what would the show be without that? We've been talking about it, I think, four or five straight weeks. And now we actually have some real meat that we can talk about. But we're going to push that aside for a moment, talk about the Knoxville elections, the races, uh, what races are still going to happen in the general election in November. But we want to start where the election is already over with that 50% plus one rule, Mayor India Kincannon won with 58% of the vote, Jeff Tallman. Uh, was the closest challenger of 29 percent so questions what do you think she plans to do obviously she has the support of people in knoxville because she just won with that election what will she do what will be her agenda for the next four years does she have any type of mandate well it depends on what her yes. uh, it depends on what her ambitions are if her ambitions are higher than mayor of knoxville then she's got to be a little careful about going with what I think are her tendencies and going too far to the left. When she first took office, she kind of flew that progressive flag pretty often. And it, it, it didn't turn out to, to her benefit or to the cities. So she drew it back in a good bit after some comment about that. And if she wants to go beyond city office what she'd run for i don't i don't know but if she does then she's going to have to not lurch way over to the left and she's going to have to be careful about just how progressive she wants to be but the reality is when you get elected mayor the chances of you losing in your re-election are pretty darn minimal because very few people want to spend the money, the time, and the effort to go up against an incumbent. And most of the people who you would hope would run for political office or would, or you think would be good at it, they don't want to go through what you have to go through to do it. So that's where we are. Greg? Well, uh, clearly she uh, has overwhelming support from the people of the city of Knoxville. I think that tells me that people are satisfied with the direction the city is going. Um, just last week, she uh, introduced a plan to help address the middle housing crisis that we have to have some more affordable housing, which is a mainstay of her first administration. And, right. will be. and of course, the thing that she said the most was to capitalize on the development of the uh, the baseball stadium, which uh, I think in, in her last term, she'll have a ribbon cutting on a, on a new baseball right. stadium. So... Uh, uh, I, I don't know that there's anything open for her higher than the city of Knoxville's mayor's office. Uh, East Tennessee is fairly Republican. Uh, the last mayor that we had that moved on to a bigger office was a strong Republican, Bill Haslam. So and uh, I don't know that she would have that support statewide, but I don't think that's important to her right now. Right now, she wants to run the city as efficiently and to uh, ad address some issues in the police department that keep coming to the fore in, in every administration that we have. So uh, again, I think the people think like the direction the city is going in, like there as she, the job she was doing and put her back in office for, for uh, four more years. Hey Don, the, yeah. the, the, the aspect of voting and whether, whether the, the electorate likes a candidate or doesn't like a candidate is I'll give you an example of how that works. San Francisco is one of the most liberal cities by any measure in the country. And voters in San Francisco kept voting the same people, type of people in time after time. And then if you go back and look just recently, three of the most liberal school board members on the in the San Francisco school board not only were recalled, they were defeated overwhelmingly by the voters of San Francisco. Why? Because the voters got angry. Because while they wanted their kids to be educated while COVID was going on, the, the school board right. out in San Francisco was worried about renaming schools to be politically correct and some other things along those lines. And the people got fed up. So the, the 
the reality is if you're not hearing about bad things, you tend to think things are pretty good. But if you turn and call attention to yourself in a way that, for example, the San Francisco school board members did, you're going to get you're going to get a lot of public backlash the same way. Well, we're going to talk about Governor Sunquist here shortly. Yeah, well, well, and I'm going to say she did focus on public safety, as Craig mentioned. She did focus on affordable housing uh, and growing jobs. And it seems like that's that's where she's come out and said already that that's going to still be her focus. Uh, I'm assuming that you would think those are the, that's the right track to be on because those are true needs in the city. You know, to if have that is, she'll be the... she'll be safe. She'll be on safe ground. Uh, is that? I, I is, don't see any. I don't see any stirrings for a recall election in Knoxville. So I'm not suggesting that, there is. That, Craig. that that can happen, you know, but I think it's unlikely and she'll see. Craig, I'm not I'm not suggesting there's going to be a recall. What I'm suggesting is if an if elected officials believe themselves, and I'm not saying Ken Cannon is in that position. I'm mm -hmm. saying what motivates voters. If if elected officials believe themselves to be inviolate that they're well, they're they're going to be safe no matter what they do that endangers the elected officials in terms of their positions that's all i'm saying i'm not well, suggesting well, cannon is going to be right, recalled please don't right, right, misunderstand right. me yeah it was just it wasn't ju just a general comment it's fine i want one more thing on that particular race do you think that to to really do some of these signature things will there be any talk of a, a possible tax increase we maybe talk about it. They, they, they had a tax increase two years ago. I right. think that's that would be the end of uh, the mayor can candidate calling for a tax increase. So uh, I, I don't think you could get it through the people in in uh, on city council at this point in time. Right. And like you, like you said, you got you got that stadium and all the things that are going to come around that. So that's that's definitely a good thing. Municipal judge uh, race is going to move on to November because. That same that same rule of fifty plus one didn't happen. Incumbent John Rawson, been judge for more than thirty years, thirty eight percent. Tyler Cavanis, former public defender, now in private practice, thirty six percent. So pretty much neck and neck in there. Uh, this is truly one of those incumbent experience, long time serving versus the new guy. Where do you see this race going uh, from here? Well, it's it was a close race. Uh, both candidates had support. Uh, pretty much isn't forced to run in the general election. And they uh, and in 2015 and in 2007, those general elections averaged 5,500 voter turnout. So it's going to be now, it's going to be up to each one of those candidates to, as they say, GOTV, get out their vote. They'll have to get their base out because they aren't going to be able to rely on a draw of the mayor's race in, in this particular election. So it's going to be, they'll have to work hard to get people to go to the polls and they'll have to work hard in the areas that they identified in the primary results uh, where they weren't very strong. So um, it, it'll be an interesting ways. It'll, it'll be right down to the wire, I think. Well, it depends to a significant degree what happens to the voters of the candidates who lost. Where do they go? Right. Or do they just not vote? Do they just stay home? Uh, without effective survey research, it's really hard to know. It's really hard to gauge. You can do it on gut and say, well, I think this is going this way, or I think he's going that way. But it's it's all guesswork right. if there's not some kind of, of specific data to which you can refer. And well, and I don't think I, I don't think John Ross has taken this for granted from the beginning. And I know he knows how hard he has to work for this. And it comes down, there are three, three legs to the campaign stool, money, organization, and emotion. There's very little emotion in this race. So it comes down to money and organization. And who's going to have the best and who's going to make it work the best? And 25% and of the uh, other voters, of course, voted for the other. Uh, There'll be a lot of shoe leather, shoe leather campaigning going on in yeah. this race. I think people will be out door to door trying to get their their point across to right. as many people as they can. It, your comment, Craig, you talked about 5,000. I mean, the turnout for early voting was about 8,500. The turnout on election day was about the same. So you basically have 15, 16,000 voters. Is that pretty typical? And is that where we're, 
we're going to be? And is it also well, kind of it, kind of pathetic? I just looked up in in 2015, uh, 5,440 people voted in the general election. And in 20, uh, 2007, when Haslam was being reelected, there was only 5,671 people voting in the in the general election. So the, the, the numbers go down significantly. And I mean, I hope that's not the case. I hope at least as many people vote in this as voted in the primary. But usually without the draw of right. a mayoral election, you don't see that uh, that that continuation of that turnout. And to your point, George, without a whole lot or I, without a whole lot of uh, emotion, yeah, you're not going to get a whole lot of numbers. I guess that's just how the way it yeah, works. Yeah, emotion, emotion can emotion can overcome organization and money, right. possibly for a short period of time. But those two things are are really are really the drivers. And when there is no emotional component, when there's no compelling negative, because people typically need a compelling negative to want to to want to turn out that people like voting against somebody more than they like voting for somebody, typically. Well, there was no lack of emotion at the special session. So what we're going to do is we take a break. When we come back, we will uh, dissect the special uh, uh, special session. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Tennessee this week. As we mentioned, we're going to talk about the special session. Governor Lee was in Knoxville on Wednesday visiting Pellissippi State, learning about the community college's technology, motorsports, uh, race car. He even put on a helmet, and he drove that race car around. I don't know if you saw that video, but uh, I didn't think he was going to fit in that little car, but he looked great. Winded that thing up, and off he went. When he was there, he was asked about the special session. He said, quote, I think our state will be safer because of the fact we did it. He talked about the fact that there was progress. You should celebrate any progress, adding that uh, it started a robust conversation that will continue into sessions beyond. Do you think that's the case? Yes, no, why? Well, I, well, I think the, gotten in that uh, sports car and, and tried to track down some state legislatures, <laughs> legislators to try to get them, you know, to come out around to his plan. Yeah. But, but I think it was a fantastic waste of taxpayer money. Uh, that three or four hundred thousand dollars they spent, the, they should pass a law requiring those legislators to to donate that money to their favorite charity. Uh, it was a black eye for the governor. Uh, he showed absolutely no leadership after calling for this session. It was a black eye for the Republican supermajority and their efforts to uh, uh, prevent demonstrations. Uh, I think it was probably a black eye for uh, Speaker Sexton and his aspirations to become the next governor. Uh, it's a long time away. People will forget a lot, but I don't know that he did anything for his campaign. And it'll be interesting to me to see if any of those covenant parents in uh, Williamson County decide to run for office. They were quite mad about the results of this. Uh, they saw what how uh, the sausage was made on Capitol Hill. And will they turn that anger into actually running for office or will they just do lobbying and advocacy and not really change the dynamics in, inside the state capitol well it was uh it was good for the governor that the session ended because i'm i'm pretty sure if it had gone on any longer his face would have wound up on a milk carton have you seen this man because he did a disappearing act that was just stunning. I mean, really, I was trying to figure out while this was going on. He has advisors and, and, and himself, and somehow they thought it was a really good idea to call a special session and outline all sorts of things that were ultimately weren't part of the call for the special session. And once the special session happened, uh, he he did a better job than Houdini of disappearing. He was must have been in an undisclosed location somewhere. And so I'm 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 just astounded at how ham-handed all of that was. Somebody should have been able to figure out we've got to do a better job than this. But they didn't. Right. And I think the the machinations within the within the, the general assembly 
uh, the, the the arguments we were just talking about here, and then the things that the the Republicans did with respect to demonstrations and all that other stuff. That's trust me. Public's memory is short. They're going to forget about this because nobody wanted this thing anyway. I mean, there were people who wanted it, but the but but Tennesseans didn't want their legislature coming up with a whole bunch of new laws that would not have solved the problem. You can do something, but that doesn't mean you're solving the problem. And so I, I think the, the whole thing was an utter waste of time, but you don't know it's an utter waste of time until you get through it. But the, just I know that you guys know, and just in case people who don't, the things that did go through that requiring TBI to report more on human trafficking, uh, two, providing free gun locks, three, requiring courts to get the crime numbers and information to TBI within 72 hours. And then there was appropriation about $100 million, $50 million in grants for mental health agencies, $30 million for school safety grants. Um, as much as we just said, the governor may have not been around uh can there be anything taken from this to say that it was successful while being overshadowed by all the chaos at the Capitol? In, well, in, in, sakes, they, there's, the Department of Safety already hands out free gun locks. Right. You know, they're already required to do human trafficking reports. Uh, the deadline timeline in, in this law is a little faster, but it's still things that were already being done. And they wound up giving $14 million in raises to state employees. That's what people wanted to see from a special session. Uh, you know, they don't like state employees. They don't like federal employees. And we gave them a pay raise in the special session. Not, you know, I'm not saying they didn't deserve it, but it's certainly nothing that couldn't have gone through the normal, regular order of budget processing that the, that the legislature goes through every year. And, and just on the topic of what was happening down there, uh, is 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 what happened basically... The uh, maybe the Republicans, uh, Speaker Sexton, the way that they approached everything, while the people who were there were clearly vocal about wanting some type of gun law being passed, are they aware that there are more Tennesseans on the side of, say, the Second Amendment and don't support red flag laws, or is it just them uh, and, and and they're not thinking about the the voters, or are they or is that the attitude they say, hey, the most vocal group is going to get the attention, but that's not what the majority wants, or is it just them? acting how well, they wanted to act government and politicians you have to you have to think of them as an as an organism and the organism has two functions like any organism two basic functions survival and reproduction in this case it means being in office and staying in office that's whether it's a bureaucracy or elected body those are kind of the immediate individual priorities and if they thought they were hurting themselves, if they thought they were endangering themselves with with by putting just this legislation forward, they'd have done something different. But they don't think they are. And yeah, I think some of it is an individual person saying, I don't think this is right, and I'm going to go back home and explain it to my mm -hmm. folks. And others are hearing from their folks, don't you, by gosh, go up there and do something that we don't want you to do. So legislators are always kind of caught in the middle. But the, but the reality is, if, if they thought it was in their interest to have passed some sort of sweeping legislation, they'd have done it. And furthermore, I don't know that it's the state's business to be handing out free gun locks. I don't know. That's, the, that's a, a taxpayer responsibility. But we're doing it, so it's, it's happening. But it, everybody wants to see the back end of this special session and to see it in the rearview mirror just as fast as they can. Greg, any comment well, the about Vanderbilt, that? The Vanderbilt poll shows that the nearly three quarters of Tennesseans want a red flag law. Uh, that's that's what a poll says, and you know, as George says, you have to translate that into pr political pressure, which is why I brought up the issue of will any of these people that have been directly affected by gun violence yeah. decide it's time to run? And that's when they start running and making issues out of these things. Then, then you may see a different conversation. All right. We'll uh, wrap up our special session conversation. We'll take a break. And we'll be right back with you. 
And welcome back to the final segment of Tennessee this week. Former Governor Don Sunquist passing away, a Republican, twice elected governor of the state, also served in Congress for more than a decade. Um, by the way, passed away following surgery and a short illness at the age of 87. A couple of questions, and both of you can respond. His legacy and what do politicians uh, learn from his time in office and, and his decisions as well? And we'll, we'll start uh, with Craig. Well, I, I had met uh, Governor Sunquist on a number of occasions, and he was a, a fine individual and uh, served his country and his in his state well. Uh, but I think he'll be permanently remembered. His legacy is proposing a state income tax, probably the first Republican ever to utter those words out of out of their mouth in Nashville. And once he did that, there was chaos at the Capitol again. There was uh, caravans of cars going around uh, the Capitol building, honking their horn, saying no income tax. And in the end, what the state legislature did was, once again, a, a, increase the state's sales tax, the most regressive form of taxation that we have. And that's the way they handled their budget crisis. Also made some strange predictions and budget proje projections to make sure everything was balanced. But unfortunately for Governor Sunquist, that's his legacy out there as, as someone who proposed a, a state income tax. Well, yeah. I was, I remember once I was in Washington and I was, had gone by his office. Actually, he, he kind of, he saw me, he waved me over and he, he wanted to talk to me about something. So we went out on the, the landing and we talked for a bit. And that's the first time we'd ever really talked at any length. And I, I remember thinking, this is, this is really a, deep thinking guy based on some of the questions you're asking me and some of the, some of the things he was, he was wanting to explore. And the, I had a few times to be able to spend a little time with him and I always found him pleasant and engaging and, and he did do some reasonably important things for the state. For example, we were talking about it before the show started in welfare reform, putting some requirements on people before they to enable them to keep getting taxpayer supported uh, welfare payments and and some other issues that were were pretty significant but the problem he had with the income tax was he campaigned against it repeatedly even when he ran for re-election for a second term he was campaigning against the income tax and then after he got elected very shortly afterwards he came out not only full force for an income tax he came out full force for an income tax, and essentially, if you didn't agree with him, there was something wrong with you. And a lot of people didn't react well to that. And it, it drove his, his approval ratings down to the point that when he left office, he was the most unpopular governor in the country. And a Democrat, Phil Bredesen, ran on the basis of, we don't need an income tax. It was reversing things. But I think on balance, Don Sunquist's overall service to the state was a positive. He was a caring and essentially effective guy in that position, but he will always be remembered as the Republican who not only championed an income tax, he completely reversed himself to champion that income tax. And I, I wonder how many times he probably wishes maybe he hadn't done that or had wished he hadn't done that are we better off without an income tax Don Ten Ten are. <laughs> i was in rhode island in a in a, a economic conference one time and a, a, the speaker of the economic development you, you got to finish this in, in 10 seconds to give craig and he seconds. said and we told him tennessee doesn't have an income tax and he said we can't match that incentive yeah. to draw new business so no we're good without an income tax craig the sales tax is the most regressive form of taxation there is. Nice. Does that mean you're for an income tax? I'm saying for income tax or not? I, I think we are for a, a more fair tax system, yes. So you're for an income tax? Yeah, okay. if it's a more fair taxing system. Wow, okay. Well, we got no. you see that on a 30 second commercial against me as I run. For no, oh, no. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, George and Craig, thank you very much. I want to no. thank everyone who is watching as well. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you next week on another episode of Tennessee This Week. 
The views of guests on Tennessee This Week are their own and do not represent the views of WATE6 on your side or Next Star Broadcasting.